All right, all right, all right. Hello, everyone. Hello and welcome to another episode of BIM After Dark Live. This is episode 74 of the show, which is pretty wild when you think about it. Uh, my name is Jeff, also known as The Rabbit Kid. Thank you for joining us. For those of you that have never seen the show before, this is a weekly live stream uh, that was started almost two years ago now, as 70, episode 74 tells you, uh, every week. And uh, we talk about Revit, BIM, and any really related software. Um, so I'm super excited uh, for the topic tonight. Um, I always get asked about Revit MEP, um, and I try to do as much as I can on my own, but I am no master of Revit MEP. I can make some make some things and, and cause some damage, but um, I by no means uh, think that I'm a master. So I'm super excited to introduce our guest soon, um, who was uh, highly regarded by all of you in the audience. So I'm super excited to, to bring him on and talk about MEP systems in Revit. Um, not just talking about the how to's and digging in, but also globally the thought process of, of, of really how you guys should be thinking about uh, this tool that we have. It's insanely powerful tool that we have at our fingertips. Um, if you have not subscribed to the channel here on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel. Um, that's how you'll know when we go live. That's how you know when new videos are posted. I've got a new series, um, a residential Revit series coming up. That's gonna also be a weekly uh, published, not live, but published videos. Um, so make sure you subscribe to the channel here on YouTube. And last but not least, I would like to thank our sponsor of this episode, Twin Motion. Twin Motion. For those of you not familiar with Twin Motion, it is a real-time rendering software built on the Unreal Engine um, with incredible features such as a gigantic uh, 3D scan library, um, real-time uh, path tracing, um, uh, presenter mode, uh, uh, a whole bunch of uh, assets and, and scene states and a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, just check out my channel. Um, I'll post some links below for, for some real details. But what I decided to do this week is actually um, highlight some, some features every week. Um, of Twin Motion, uh, just to give you guys a sense of some of the cool things that exist. Um, if you're interested, head on over to twinmotion.com slash BIM after dark. Um, the feature I'm gonna highlight this week is actually kind of related to MEP um, because the way I use it is for underground utility visuals. And so what you're seeing here on the screen is a Twin Motion scene that I created. And the, the feature is actually an X-ray material. Um, so uh, when you apply materials to, to objects in Twin Motion, and these are all Revit models being viewed in Twin Motion, you can use what's called an X-ray material, which can be super useful for things like underground utilities, which you're seeing here. Um, I've used them for in-wall. Um, so for example, showing systems in a wall, uh, pipes maybe behind a head wall at a hospital, for example, is, an, is something I've used them for. Um, so super simple, super easy to use. Um, you can see actually the flexibility of the software and all the, all the scene states and all the visibilities. There's a, a bunch of features that you definitely wanna check out. Check out the the review I have uh, here on the blog, which I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll link below, and uh, and definitely head on over to twinmotion.com/bimafterdark to start a free trial today and let them know that you support this show as well as them. And so, with all that being said, uh, before I introduce my guest, I want to also remind you that if you're here tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern time, um, it is live, and so I will be checking out the chat and feel free to ask questions. Heckle, whatever you want to do. I will only let David know when uh, it's something pertinent to not throw him off too much, unless it's a really funny heckle, then I'll let you know, David. But with all that being said, I think it's about time we introduce David Butts. What's going on, man? Hey, man, how's it going tonight? Oh, uh, it's, it's it's great. I, I First, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. As I mentioned in the intro, I am an architect. I do Revit architecture, and I've been doing it for many, many, many years, and I've just dabbled on the side of MVP. So whenever someone asks me MVP stuff, um, I try my best, but I'm, I'm always willing to bring on experts. And I gotta be honest with you, and if you guys out there feel like you are charismatic experts of MEP and would like to join the show, reach out to me, because they're hard to find. So thank you, David, for joining the show. <laughs> well, since you're an architect, I have something for you that I'm gonna send to you because you can't be an architect without having a cool hat. <laughs> right. That's right. That's it's, right. It's and, and I wear much more hats these days now that I don't have much yeah, hair. Well, me too. There, so. I mean, I get a lot more sunshine <laughs> up here than I used to. But yeah, I mean, it's just awesome to be here. I, I'm just, you know, when you sent me the email, I was like, man, this is awesome. I've never had a chance to do one of these before. And as many sessions, I've taught over 75 classes at AU. And it's just kind of like doing something like this. I like it because it's a little bit more intimate and we can sit here and really get into the details and talk about 
what's cool about the software that we use and how we use it every day. Yeah. So there's just 100%. a lot of cool stuff that we can talk about. 100%. And, and yeah, I appreciate you taking the time and, and willing to come on. Um, yeah, it's funny. I, I, I've, you know, your name has always been around and it's felt, felt so familiar. And so usually, you know, when that's the case in the Revit world, it's always been sort of like maybe it was a blog first, then maybe Twitter, maybe on the forums. But I feel like your name is actually from AU Sessions the most. So so congratulations oh, yeah. on that, because I know you have tons of success uh, speaking at AU. So congrats on all that stuff. <laughs> right. And I've got a pretty diverse background. I actually um, started, I've been doing, working with Autodesk products for 37 years now. Actually started on AutoCAD release two, so I'm an official old guy. I mean, <laughs> we, you look at AutoCAD, what 1982? It's 40 years old now. Yeah, that's right? pretty wild. 40 years old, and so 1997, I joined an Autodesk reseller, and uh, we had four architectural clients. And my degree was in architecture, and I'm thinking, okay, this should be easy. And it was like, oh no, it's not easy at all. And so, in '97, I was one of the original architects with desktop gunslingers. Got invited up to Henniker, New Hampshire, in a one-stop light town. Drove up to the salt box style houses that Dave Arnold had, and looked at that. And I'm like, "You've got to be kidding me! Is this really where this stuff is started? This whole object-oriented program?" And then, yeah, it was, and got to meet a lot of really cool people. You know, they've been in the industry for a long time. And then, um, what actually happened to be in the Revit Technology Corporation office the day that Autodesk acquired Revit. So I'm like, "Here we go again." You know, we had architectural desktop that had been bought from from Softdesk, and now we're buying Revit. And it's like, oh, there's all kinds of discussions going on about how we're going to use this. And I'm sitting there raising my hand going, guys, we have no engineering tools. It's great that you have the architecture tools, but where's my duck? Where's my pipe? And as a reseller, it was like, what right. the hell am I supposed to do with this? You know, it's like, yeah. And it wasn't until what? To Revit version... God, was it? Two, when was I mean, when was systems introduced? Well, systems when, came when, out sorry, of that. When when was the because it was never it was three different packages. So when was the MEP package? Was it 2010? No. Yeah, 2010, 2009, 2010 is really when it became a, okay. a feasible package. Yeah. yeah. And and at the time we didn't have any documentation, so I actually wrote some of the first training manuals that um, we, we were selling at Advanced Solutions and at Cadre for years on this. And then um, it was really cool to get that stuff out there and have it out there. And I learned a lot by just writing the package. And if I can't explain it to somebody else by writing it, how's anybody else going to understand it? Right, right, right. <laughs> so it was really awesome. cool. I had a lot of fun doing this stuff. And it, it was a really great time to be coming up through through the Autodesk ranks at that point. I'm sure. So, so yeah. So, um, I'm, I mean, I guess we don't need to say much more as far as your bio is concerned, and I'm sure I'm yeah. sure I'm sure many people can Google you and 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 find out the the rest of it. But um, I, I think uh, I think we should jump right into it because I'm super excited for the content. So cool. I, I think maybe um, I, I know you've got sort of a, a thought on on a sort of monologue that we can take 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 in whatever direction we need to. So uh, if you want to just jump out there, and then I'll, I'll I'll probably chime in with questions and 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 interrupt you at good points uh, to, to keep the conversation going. But I'm ready. I'm ready to just jump into this. Uh, I'm, I'm super excited to hear your your perspective on systems and, and how we're going to approach this today. So so let's let's talk about the systems part of this. And, and the thing to me is that's really fascinating about the industry as a whole is that, you know, the systems that we deal with, there's a wide variety of these. And I, I don't know if you have the image up now, but let's take a look at this guy real quick. I mean, these are just some of the project examples that we work on. And to me, a system is a lot more than just a plumbing system. It's more than just connecting pipe. It's more than just throwing some receptacles in a drawing. It's all about creating these relationships that you need with, with the engineering documents that you have. And here's the fun part about it. A lot of people, you're probably aware of this, but MEP really doesn't get the attention that it deserves. Because if you think about it with the systems that we develop, if you look at a set of documents on a project, who has the largest number of documents on the project it's not the architect sorry jeff you guys you come no, in third it's not you know not. <laughs> but you drive everything we do right <laughs> and we have structural okay it's nice to hold things up for us we're really glad that you do that for us but really when it comes down to it 60 percent of the drawings in a typical project are all about the mep systems the stuff you don't see mm -hmm. in the stuff in the walls and and under the floor and above the ceilings and the things that just keep us comfortable Mm -hmm. you know, keep things clean. And so they're really important aspects of what we do with design. And it's just amazing to me the the lack of coverage that it gets for how important it is. Yeah. And so as we look at this and how these tools work, I think one of the things that got lost as these tools progressed wasn't really the features. I mean, because if you talk to people who started in Revit early on, they didn't use it. Why? Because it didn't have what they needed. Right. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I can't do piping with this. It doesn't have the fittings. It doesn't have the families, right? And we we heard that all the time. And when I started writing the documents, I said, how do I explain this in such a way to get people to be engaged? And so we started this off by looking at what we call the four-step process, right? And that four-step process is really all about, you know, the way to work inside of Revit so that you put this thing together correctly. And so if you follow this process, it makes it a hell of a lot easier to learn how to use the program. So it starts off with something really simple. And we're just going to flip through this really fast and we'll try to get to as fast as we can. But how many of you guys start off a project by drawing a duct? I actually had an engineer. That's what he would do. I need to know where the duct's going to go. No, you don't. You don't even know what the duct's connecting to yet. <laughs> you know, we got we to gotta know where we're sending things to. And, and so we started off by calling it what the target and source equipment is. And so at the very start of a project, in the early phases, preliminary design, you need to be picking what the equipment is for the project as soon as you can. Mm-hmm. And even if it's just a placeholder, we have to know that I've got to have air terminals. I've got to have lights. I've got to have all this, this other stuff. And mm-hmm. by the way, architects don't own the lights. The electrical engineer does, right? We have that great argument all the time. It's oh, like, yeah. oh, I get to place it. No, I got to wear it, you know? <laughs> we always have that great argument, but let's, let's define it real quick. A target is something that receives air fluid or power, right? And that's what carries and defines load in a system. So these are the most important pieces that you can have out there. And so targets can be air terminals, plumbing fixtures, lights, you know, all this stuff can define, you know, what a target is. And so you want to make sure that you're getting this stuff placed early and as accurately as possible. And we know architects like to change things that never happens. Right. Mm -mm. And the nice thing about working with rabbit, you use some hosted elements, you use some other things like that. We don't use a lot of of hosted elements, but we do try to create some constraints to help things move along. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we do that, then we have to understand what the source is. And the source is always one thing. It's what controls the flow of air fluid and power back to a target. And so let, I'm going to ask you a trick question here. And this, let's see if you can figure this one out. Oh, boy. It, it, and, and everybody's going to laugh at this one because if you've been in my classes at AU, and I know about a dozen of you that are out here watching tonight, right, Tom, if you're here, how much did we talk about this, right? <laughs> when I have an air, t- air terminal, is the flow in or out of the terminal? If I'm talking about airflow, what's the direction? You get a 50-50 chance of getting this right. I would say it depends on if it's a supply or return. <laughs> you almost got it right. That's what you call a non-committal answer, right? Right, right. <laughs> so the, so the, correct, <laughs> the correct answer is in because you have air coming out of a VAV box, out of a out of a terminal unit, whatever, into the, um, into the air terminal. And so that's a... That's a lost concept on a lot of people because mm. they sit there and think that, oh, well, flow is always out of the air terminal because they're thinking in terms of the room. Mm. No, think in terms of the system. Mm-hmm. That's the key that you have to think about. So you have to understand those sources because they're going to accumulate all that data that you put out to that particular device. So it could be an air handling unit, a pump or a tank, power panel. In the case of a circuit, they're all forms of a system, right? Mm-hmm. And so the cool part about this is some items are going to be targets and sources like a power panel. That could be something, a VAV box that controls air, you know, VAV box becomes a target. And so we want to make sure that we understand how that stuff works. So I'm, you mind if I bounce over to Revit real quick no, and show you a picture of this? So I'm going to switch over real quick just so you guys can see this. So I've already got a few examples in here to show how this works. And one of the things that you need to look at when you're defining the systems is we talk about, you know, what is it that we need to know for this particular item? So I'm going to sign an airflow of 100 to one of these and I'm going to grab a couple more and I'm going to say, okay, what's the airflow going to be? It's going to be 200 here. And then I'm going to come back to this one. I'm going to say it's going to be 150 here. Right. All right. So when I put these things together, I have all these di- disconnected pieces right now. And this is typically what happens in a drafting mode. You typically don't put that information with this object. Right. But to define the system, you're simply going to grab the parts and say, Hey, make a duct system. It's going to be supplier. I'm going to call it supplier one, give it a name. I like to put the room in here, you know, where is it actually located? Mm-hmm. All that good stuff shows up in here. So when I create that system, now I have that information about what that system is, and it shows as a connected system. And so it's real simple to define the system in this particular case, and that's where it's going to carry the load, right? Mm-hmm. So if I look at any of the system properties, it's pretty easy. I can actually pick on any one of these guys. And look at the system properties. I can actually see what that particular device is. I can edit it. I can move things. I can add things to that system. And so I'm doing this very early on in the project, right? Mm-hmm. I want to get this stuff as grouped together as, as quick as I can, as fast as I can. 
Same thing happens to lights. I'm going to grab all these lights and I'm going to say, let's create a power circuit for this. I'm not going to associate it with a panel right now, but they are going to carry load. And here's a big piece of advice for you too. If you have a fixture or something that you know is going to be continuous or it's going to be a common example, as you set up your content, go ahead and preload data in here. If you know this light's going to be a, you know, a, a 12 watt LED bulb, whatever it's going to be in that case, it's a good idea to go ahead and have those load values assigned as much as possible. I'm not a fan of the Google when it comes to go and getting Revit content. <laughs> and I know everybody does this, right? We all go out and grab, I can't find it in the Autodesk library. So I go out and grab the stuff off of Google mm -hmm. and they bring it in. They've got all this data with it. And a lot of times it's duplicate data. It's not the right data. It's not what we need for our schedules. And so you got to pay attention when you're actually placing this equipment of that critical information. So that's the first thing is that you got to make sure that you get these devices placed and see, there's no geometry. There's no duct work right now. Right. This should be the first step that you do on every MEP project, whether it's piping systems, duct systems, air system, doesn't matter. Right. So we cool on that one right there. No, that's awesome. That, that's, and honestly, uh, <laughs> that's actually, you know, as someone who doesn't. And so I think all the architects out there who don't draw systems every day, uh, or model them mm -hmm. every day, um, I think that's, I mean, that was eye opening for me. I, I, you know, I always think of, of, you know, I mean, I guess I live a lot of my life in the, in the actual, uh, ducts and pipes these days. And so, you know, the, mm -hmm. the idea of setting up the whole system first and then creating the arteries afterwards is just it makes sense, right? It, it's, it's right. cause then all you're doing is connecting them and the routes they take, that's a whole, that's a whole nother ordeal. So that alone yeah. to me is, is a, is a, is a, is a great great eye-opening uh, uh, touch on on how these things work. So awesome. Yeah, and like I said, it's going to be a whole bunch of different things. I mean, you got pumps and tanks and power panels. They're all going to be different forms of targets and sources. They all have that relationship. So it's really the next part about this that you have to understand is that the ability to create that target source relationship. We talk about how the targets hold data, but the equipment is going to accumulate that data, right? Mm -hmm. And so in order to do this, there's two ways to do it. One is by simply drawing duct to connect things together. I'm not a fan of doing that, right? Because at this point, I don't know what that relationship is. And so when I'm creating the target source relationship, you have to understand that targets always define the system, okay? It's always going to be that air terminal. It's always going to be that light. It's always going to be the pump or the tank or whatever the thing is that defines the system. And that's what's going to actually collect the load and it can be one or more devices you can create a system but like you just saw i grabbed all those lights at once mm -hmm. and i created the power system in a really fast way to create that base relationship and the key is to make sure you go ahead and assign those load values when you do this so we saw that first step in there right and then we have to talk about what the source is so we have to create that relationship now there are very few things in revit that don't have a source Mm -hmm. A plumbing system is a great example of something that typically doesn't have a source, like a sanitary waste system. Mm -hmm. Really don't want to know what the source is in that kind of a system. <laughs> right? Right. But in that case, you know, when I talk about basic systems like lights, there's going to be a source. It's going to be a panel. Air systems, it's going to be a VAV box. So you want to create that part that, so that it can track and summarize that load. And there's one couple of notes on this, too, for you guys that are making equipment. I'm going to give you a tip right now. It's really important. Don't link your connectors. You're going to thank me for this later, but don't link your connectors because only accessories that are in line and fitting should ever have their connectors linked. Don't ever do it. Okay. That's your $2 tip for tonight. Send your checks to Jeff and we're going to split them. Okay. <laughs> so, so you're talking, you're talking, I don't want to move on that real quick because you're talking in the family of the equipment. Don't link the connectors. Is that what you're, you're talking right, about? In the family of the equipment. Like if I look at this VAV box and I go edit this guy and I've seen people do this all the time. I, I, I think I know what you're talking about, but I want you to clarify because I think it's great. I think it's a great point. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I, I, I'm, a lot of people know that I'm part of the directly program as an expert elite, they make you commit to doing things for Autodesk. Hmm. So, and one of my things was to help start the uh, directly program that takes about a third of all the support cases that come into Autodesk. Okay. And so I see all these cases come flying by and I really only answer the MVP ones. So I don't take a whole lot of them. Right. Mm -hmm. But when I get in here and I look, this is one that's a real common one. Somebody will take this connector and they'll do this thing called link connectors. Don't ever do that because this is a pass through. You're actually, Pass it. If a device is not a piece of equipment, you can actually screw up the data that goes on the other side. Hmm. The way you do this, and I'm going to show you a really sophisticated family that we have that has a lot of formulas and stuff built into it, like how to calculate watts, how to calculate load, mm -hmm. a lot of stuff you can do with your families, right? 
But in this particular case, I've done it very simple in this case. I just said, hey, I'm going to assign another parameter to the connector on the other side and say that one's airflow rate. So that's everything I have that's a target has that same shared parameter associated to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then what I'm doing is taking the accumulated value that comes into that connector. It's actually the equipment. It's receiving all that data from the air terminals. And I'm just saying, total this up and put it here. That's how you transfer a load. Okay. Got it. Got it. So, instead of, so instead of linking connectors, you're just using a formula to take the value from one connector and put it to the other. Exactly. And it's such a simple, elegant yeah. answer, right? Yeah. It's, it's perfect. It doesn't yeah. take a whole lot of work, but you'd be amazed at how many people screw that thing up. <laughs> awesome. And awesome. So to do that relationship, it's real simple, man. I just come over here and I grab a part. And I say, hey, let's look at the system. And I select the equipment. Now I, I go ahead and grab that component. And now if I go back and I look at the system, you can actually tab select. Mm. It's a really great little tool too, because if you're going to copy these guys, right? Tab select, pick it. You see all the connected system. There's our, our VAV box. Everything's cool. We're lined up. We're connected. We're together, right? Mm -hmm. And so I can start tracking load on all these devices. I can split the system up. We're going to talk about generating layouts in just a minute here, Okay. Let me ask a question before you move on from that, because I'm interested. Um, uh, th was Is there a reason why you would select the targets first, create the system, and then add the the source to the targets in this case? Because uh, that's- You or, always have or, to pick the target or, first. So, so you could, if you selected the source and all the targets initially and said create system, would it be a different outcome? No, it won't work. Oh, it only works no. one way. Got it. That's the, that, and again, that's the other part that people get fouled up. They think mm -hmm. that the system gets defined by the equipment. No, it's the other way around. It's hierarchical from the bottom up, right? Mm -hmm. it, I mean, people think, well, I've got to start up here at the main air handling unit. Then I have to go to the VAVs. Then I have to go to the air terminals. That is not how it works. It's always working from the bottom up. Got it. Awesome. No, that's so, cool. there, there is a question in the chat real quick before we move on about, sure. the, linked, about the linked connectors um, from Jason, who, uh, who asked if the connectors are preset and calculated wouldn't Revit do that automatically not necessarily no I found and, and I tell you I've, I've experimented with this a million different ways the, and, and I just the most consistent and predictable way to get this to work is when you're working with an air terminal or any anything that's a target you know you see the direction it's going to draw the air shows the direction mm -hmm. that the duct's going to be drawn in right mm -hmm. you know you can use a flow configuration of preset or in okay You've got a bunch of different office, you know, a bunch of different values. But if you're doing it preset in this case, I can actually go through and say how I want this to be assigned. I want to assign the flow and that value. So preset represents that value that you see. Mm -hmm. But the key is to make sure that you're using flow direction in. Now, I have seen this work with return. And I know some people on return system, exhaust systems, they want to have this thing set to out. You can do it both ways, but I've had better luck with calculations with it being in on all these connectors. Got it. Okay, because Which it's goes not back to your first point of system your first question of in. It's always in, right? Yeah, it's always in. Got it's it. the system relationship. It's not the physical airflow, and that's what fouls people up. Mm -hmm. It's not the physical fluid flow, right? Right. Yep. It's, yep. it's the direction of the relationship. Mm -hmm. That's the key part to figure out about this. Mm -hmm. All right, so. So cruising back over to this CAG unit and looking at how that system is defined, mm -hmm. it's the same thing with the light fixtures. So if I if I pick the lights, I already see that they're part of a circuit, and I go ahead and select the panel name. And one thing Autodesk has done a really good job of in the last couple of years is they have finally spent a lot of money on electrical. You know, how long did it take? And I'm a really good friend of Martin Schmidt. 12, of 12 years, right? It's taken 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have been wearing Martin out about this thing, right? And it's just kind of like, finally, he's like, fine, I'm tired of listening to you complain about it. Get over here and help us develop it. So I've been working with a couple of other people to help develop the electrical tools for the last few years. And we finally got, instead of just breaker connection, we got feed through lugs. You know, we've got better load calcs that are going on. We have the ability to do circuit naming schemes. Those are all things that help. Mm -hmm. But again, it's the exact same step that you do with air system. You create the lights as the targets, and then you select the panel as the source. Mm -hmm. And then when you go do your panel schedule, the load's already going to be there because the load's already on the lights, mm -hmm. right? So those are just a couple of things and, and how the system works. And that was the missing step from CAD. Yeah. We didn't have that in AutoCAD MVP. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's jump through this because we want to get through them fairly quick. So the next step, and this is the most important one, how many of you guys are interested in generative design? There, there's actually, it's funny you say it. So remember, there's a nine second delay. So I'll be, I'll, I'll read them as it comes back. But just before you said that, um, Justin in the chat asked about 
Was it Justin? Somebody asked. Somebody asked about Dynamo uh, in, in MEP. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just a general question. But uh, but I'm so I'm assuming there's probably some interest. I would say, uh, and I'll wait for the chats to come in. But I would venture to say that most people are interested in it as a concept. But I don't think similar to when Dynamo first came around. I don't think anyone mm -hmm. sees where they can use it yet. You know, and it took it took a few years for people to see, and then all of a sudden the floodgates opened. I think. I think generative design is at that phase, personally. I mean, that's my, my opinion. <laughs> so you've seen the technology curve, right? You mm -hmm. got to get past that chasm yep. and then it peaks and come back. It's been yes. around for a million years, right? We right. haven't made it to the chasm yet, okay? Mm -hmm. Not with Dynamo and general design. I think we the potential is enormous like Lisp in, mm -hmm. and AutoCAD, right? Mm -hmm. And .NET and everything else that came out of that. And right. so we're not quite there. But here's the funny part about it. You know, Autodesk was doing a little bit of generative design back when they first put automatic layouts in Revit. Mm -hmm. And it was a great example of rules-based design. It's how do I make these ducks behave the way I need them to behave? And it's still not smart. Like they can't recognize when they're going through a wall or how to avoid that column right in front of them, right? They're just not that smart. Right. And I see that all the time. People Coordinated drawings. How many times have you seen people draw ducks through steel? Every single day. <laughs> Don't you people look at this stuff in 3D? I'm sorry. Every single but, day of my life. <laughs> but this does do connecting geometry for you. And this is really, you, you want to get the systems defined first and then worry about the connecting geometry. Don't mm -hmm. draw your ducks first. Because unless you know what the loads are going to be. Now, yes, it can define the system relationship if you don't take that step. But to me, I, I much rather grab everything and so say, let's define those relationships first. When you get more into 2022 and you start seeing the analytical systems, you're going to understand why you want to do this. Okay. Another discussion, another story. We'll talk about that hopefully in September. Um, but we have automatic and manual layouts that you do. So you can draw duck your own on your own, right? You can do all these layouts on your own. Um, before you do any of this, make sure you're reviewing the mechanical settings and you want to include what the main and branched up and pipe types and elevations are for routing. If you're going to do automatic routing, if it's a fairly simple route, sometimes it is faster to use these tools. Um, the system sizes are also set in the, in the mechanical settings. So that's what's gonna set the um, external sizes, all that other good stuff that you have in there. So let's bounce back over here again real quick and just show an example of this. So if I look at the wiring, you see how this stuff is selected? Mm -hmm. One of the things I really love about this stuff is that when you, when you start really messing around with it, you get all kinds of cool stuff like, hey, draw the wires for me. You know, so as I, as I tab select through this, let me see if I've actually got that. Tab, grab. Okay, I don't have the wire turned on. It's a visibility graphics issue here. And I'm controlled by a template. What the hell? We'll come back to that. <laughs> you didn't see this, but believe me, we just drew all the wires, right? <laughs> right. But I can also label all that stuff as well, too. Well, let's do it with the duct and see how that works. And before you really do anything with the duct, like if I go to manage and I go to MEP systems and, or MEP settings, I go to mechanical, you want to check things like what are my heights going to be? So like if I'm doing supplier, I want that duct main to be at 12. I want the the branch to be at 12 and I want to use flex duct coming off these pieces. And again, this is that rules-based design that we talk about. Mm -hmm. So if you're really thinking about getting into generative design, this is a great early example to learn how this works, right? Simple for somebody who's understanding the basics in there. And so I go ahead and pick that. And now when I say, okay, I want to actually have this thing do an automatic layout. I just select the system and say, generate layout. And I start to get these preliminary layouts that I can cycle through. So the blue represents the main branch and the green the main duct and the green represents the branch. And so you can cycle through all these options till you find the one you want. You can also go back and check your settings and so you just say, finish the layout and it creates the duct for you. Now you still going up getting some weird things that might show up like, Oh, I've got an open duct here. And they've improved this tool to say, Hey, cap the open end. So it's no longer an open system, mm -hmm. but now it's a closed system. And this is what we call a well-formed system in here. Okay, because it's closed, it doesn't have any openings and it can calculate its sizes correctly. Mm. So you look at the time that it took me to go through these steps, right? And the amount of time it took, and I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that automatic layouts are going to be your solution for a lot of things. But if I'm doing like a lot of classrooms and a lot of repetitive type rooms, it's a great way to get started. And then I can pick this whole system up and copy it mm. if I need to, because it's well formed, it will create another system, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't have to draw it from scratch, you just copy it. Yep. Same thing we do with AutoCAD, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so actually, this this I think this is a good point. Um, where uh, there were a couple of conversations, and I don't have to read the whole chat there, but um, about mm -hmm. the the calculated values and and using 
um, using it for analysis. Um, so it sounds like I, I think the question was kind of along the lines of, you know, do you trust or use the 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 calculations and the analysis within it within Revit? I'm using it more than I used to. Okay. I'm, I'm getting a little bit more comfortable with it. And part of it is, is that you got to understand the rules that it's using when you get in here to set these things up, like the calculation method for ducks. They're very clear mm -hmm. about what these use. Col Colbrook is something that we use on a regular basis, right? Right. And so for most basic systems, you can do duck sizing in this. There's been a big debate about a lot of the duck sizing programs that are out there right now. Do they work right? Mm -hmm. Are they really representative? Especially some of these older ones that we trusted for a long time. But now that we're in this BIM environment, it's probably better not to have to take this stuff out of the environment to something else, mm -hmm. out of my silo into something else. Right. 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 And then feed it so back. It, right. <laughs> so it's going to, it's definitely gotten better. I trust it more than I used to, but again, it's all in the user, man. If you don't make this system well formed and complete your connections, right. You don't connect it right. And you, you fudge it. You're never going to get a good calculation. Yep. And, and that's exactly what I was going to bring it back to. Right. The, the, if you follow the, process you're talking about now you can have more confidence in the system because you've 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 done the correct steps to get there um, exactly so and, and actually somebody commented I think tony i think is his name i can't read it from here uh was saying that you know when it's set up correctly um you know as long as you understand you can probably get a good percentage of it done and, and i think that's kind of where, where i would be if i was if i was doing this every day is probably you know understanding that this can do a lot of that initial calculation but there's always going to be just like anything right. really generative design um uh, you know, usually it's it's getting it to a point, and then there's a human touch that's involved almost all the time, right? That's that's sort of oh, yes. the end the end level there. So, yeah, and there's always the ability to tweak things, man. I mean, I like mm -hmm. the fact that I can sit here and say, "Hey, I'm going to drag this duck and move these things," and everything seems connected mm -hmm. because it's a system, right? It knows that it belongs to each other, mm -hmm. and so we belong together. Whatever great <laughs> song is, right? right? <laughs> and you don't want me singing. Everybody else said they're going, "Please stop!" Right? <laughs> And if that was Tony Conchata who asked that question, he's going to give me a lot of crap tomorrow because he's my my coworker and colleague over at Gannett Fleming. That's no, the I don't other think you're so I think you're so. okay right now. <laughs> so that's so, the other so Tony. When, yeah, okay. when you have a system built like this and you have the rules set up, um, it, when you're if if you're modifying the system, is it is it readjusting the calculations and sizes, or, yeah. or is that yeah, it is. Yeah, if you go back, it, it doesn't do it automatically, right? Okay. So like, if I change the airflow on this to three hundred. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as the system type and we'll as long as it still works, here. I'm assuming too, right? If it doesn't work, it'll probably right. Tell it's you. still <laughs> as long as it's still a well formed system, right? right? So if I look at my duct systems in here and I say, okay, I look at my supplier that I'm using right now, right? Mm -hmm. And as long as I've got calculations turned on, I'll do all in this case, right? In this case, now what's happening is the duct system is actually tracking load at points, mm -hmm. and so if I use the system inspector on this and just say, go ahead and inspect this, I can actually see the flow along mm -hmm. those points, along with the red line defining where that primary flow is. Mm -hmm. So again, this is all in making sure you have your system set up correctly and see how it's adjusting by what the flow is at that area. Mm -hmm. So again, it's all about a well-formed system. Right. And if you take the time to do it correctly and it's closed, it can calculate, you set the static pressure loss, whatever you have, and then you can use the duct sizing tools. And I like using larger uh, connected and calculated just to make sure that it never goes below the minimum of what I have. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there's just some rules that when you're doing this stuff, as long as you understand those rules, you'll be fine. Awesome. There was one okay. question I wanted to just tap on while you're talking about the systems and you were mentioning copying it around. Somebody did ask, um, is, is there any, I mean, I'm going to expand on the question. It was a little basic question, but, um, when you're, when you're, once you have this well-formed system, um, copying it, mirroring it, rotating it, like what are, are there limitations to how you can copy this system around a building? Have you noticed, like, if you mirrored it, if you rotated it? I mean, is there, is there? Don't that... mirror it. <laughs> I was going to say, like say, pictures. I was going to say, is it, is it like groups where you got to be really careful with how you, how you actually uh, rotate or, or, or and, and don't it? group it either. Got it. That's another one. If you do a group, you can do an initial group, but you better ungroup it when you get done. So in that situation, if, 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 yeah. Yeah. so if, if you needed to mirror it, would you, would you build, just build, would you be better off building the system mirrored on the other side and starting? I would disconnect all the ducts. Yeah. Yeah. Just disconnect the duct, mm -hmm. mirror the air terminals because they don't care. Right. Don't want to, you don't From want the starting spot, right. Because those are the starting right. spots anyway. So mirror those, right. mirror the source if you want, or copy the source, whatever it ends up being, and then do the yeah. re reconnect everything. Okay. Yeah, awesome. here, here's one thing you can't do. You can't cross connections. Like, I can't do this. At least you couldn't do this. See, so, yeah, I tell you, it's been modified in the opposite direction, right? Mm. It doesn't understand that at all. 
Mm -hmm. because you're not mirroring the fittings. Now the connector's on the other side. It can't create the connection. Uh, I see. Yep. So yep. don't drag across fittings. That's a key rule in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. All right. So let's get to the last step here real quick because I'm going to get into some other areas real fast. And um, kind of talk about the last step in the process in here. And really it's that the last step is when you actually start to annotate. And I know people really get a little bent out of shape about me telling you don't label anything don't put any dimensions down right mm -hmm. and so in this particular case sorry i got really out of focus all of a sudden what's going on with the camera it's, it's it wants to um, focus on something behind you i don't know <laughs> it's it's actually focusing on jeff right now it's kind of like that commercial you see i'm not the <laughs> primary character in the picture anymore right right, right. <laughs> and, and so so in this case there are a couple of rules about doing the systems tag it tag 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 don't use plain text Mm. pull and harvest that data from the objects right yes and, and, and <laughs> use that information and don't just copy tags you're not copying tags you're harvesting information so use that tag all feature to grab everything and then in your schedules you know you want to schedule and pull this information this is a key part too you want to make sure that you're putting shared parameters especially with mechanical equipment only in the families do not make them as project parameters and the main reason being is that when you assign a project parameter, it's going to apply to all examples of mechanical equipment, which can include air handling units, pumps, BAV boxes, process equipment. Mm -hmm. And so if you put an air value on a pump, it's going to sit there and go, I don't have those values. And there's no way to wipe it out if you do it as a project parameter. Mm -hmm. If you do it as a shared parameter in the family, then it's only going to apply to that one family. So that's a key rule in here is to understand when you put these parameters. It's not like architecture where we got all the walls and we can put all the parameters we have in there. The architect can get one thing you have to deal with. Mm -hmm. The wall, we have all these other systems and parts that we have to deal with. So we got to make sure we do that. And then dimension. When you when you got it laid out the way you want, dimension it. Now I do use dimensions to do like equidistant constraints, you know, mm -hmm. center stuff in a room. You can do that kind of stuff. But why wait until now? Because really we talk about the stages of a project and you know this one. I mean, what were the, what are the four stages of a project? You start off, you got schematic design mm -hmm. and then you got uh, design development, right? And then construction documents. And then the most important stage is a four stage. You know what that is, right? Construction. <laughs> no, it's the panic stage. It usually occurs okay. two days before the end of one of those deadlines. <laughs> right. Because right. that's when people make decisions about what's going on with the, with this component. And so, you want to get as much of the model fleshed out as you can before you start annotating doing it. So really it's, it's important, but it's not as important as getting the model right. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's a four step process. And I we're, now we're taking up most of the conversation with this and I can hang out a little bit longer if we need to, that's not a problem with me, no, but the whole awesome. idea here is to make sure that people understand this process going into it. And you don't have to do the whole building this way. Like you can work at, let's do a floor at a time or an area at a time, but mm -hmm. work through that whole process and get everything done then complete it and follow those steps. And you will be a hell of a lot happier with Revit MEP than you would be if you went and just started throwing stuff in there. Awesome. So let, let's just to reiterate before we move on from it. So let me see if I remembered it without going back to the slides. Let's, <laughs> so step one was um, place your targets, right? Define your targets. Right. Uh, yep. Step two was your sources, I believe, right? right? Or, or sorry, that's, an, not, that's not, part of the first step. Yeah, yeah so part of the first step. Step two was actually creating the relationship between them, right? Right. And then step three was generating the geometry uh, mm -hmm. using whatever method we decide. But at this at this point, we're already we've got our sources there, we've got our relationship, and all we're doing is connecting the dots basically. And then step right. four is tagging, annotating, dimensioning, scheduling, and all the all the good stuff from it. Right. It's all those little pieces that have to go into this and have to go into it early on, right? Mm -hmm. And so as long as you follow this process with MEP, now what this other, what this also does is it's going to change the workflow. And let's talk about the next topic in here is how the systems alter your perspective towards MEP design, right? Mm -hmm. One of the hardest things to get design teams to do is to change the location of where a task occurs, Right. And, and in a CAD world, we're really guilty of pushing things like electrical to the back of the bus, right? Mm -hmm. Because we got to have all this other stuff done. The conduit and cable tray is going to be the last thing because it's all good. It's going to fit in wherever it fits, right? Mm -hmm. But the reality of it is the data that's associated with all this and every bit of piece of equipment that goes into a project is very much important at the very early stage. Because if you get buy-in very early on about these primary targets and sources, you're going to dramatically cut down the change orders that you have in a project. Cause what we're really trying to do is instead of having that 15, 25 
you know, 60% deliverables that we've had for years, we really want to alterate that around to be 30, 30, 30, right? Mm -hmm. And get it more even so that we're, we're making fewer changes at the end of the cycle in that panic stage. Because mm -hmm. I see that all the time. And, and even on some of our big projects, we still do that. That one project down in the corner that was the Clayton Water Treatment Plant, those guys modeled that building in three months. Mm -hmm. And we're a year and a half into the project. And a big bulk of that is because of the changes that were made by client requirements over the course of the design. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was just like we had this time and all of a sudden we're changing everything. And so those are things that can happen over the course of the project. But the more you get it well formed at the start of the job, the easier it is to take care of things down the road mm -hmm. and address those changes easier and, and have fewer change orders and, and errors and emissions. 100 percent. Well, one of the things actually I'm kind of interested in um, is, uh, you know, we on the on the construction side. So so, you know, I as an architect, I spend my my day job is on the construction management side now and dealing with model mm -hmm. interactions, especially early on in pre-constructions, dealing dealing with even quantity takeoff from models, for example. And one of the questions that I never get a real straight answer with is, um, you know, how how much of this stuff can get pro, you know, MEP is always, as you mentioned, right? It's always very, it feels like it's late, you know, it, it gets later and later in the game on every job, right? Mm -hmm. and, as far as what's modeled versus maybe what's a narrative or what's a schematic sketch type of deal. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, I'm curious as to, you know, what is it that's stopping MEP engineers from, from pulling, from, from modeling that early, uh, at least some, like you said, like, can you laying out the targets and sources, for example, is that really a big deal to, to do that really it's, early on? It's a habit. Hmm. I, I don't talk, You just said something that touched on me that drives me absolutely crazy. <laughs> Narrative. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Why in, the, why in the heck are we doing a narrative mm -hmm. when I, we can sit there? My narrative should be, how many square feet do you have here? Okay. I know about what my power load is going to be based on that number alone. Oh, it's mm -hmm. a commercial building. Great. And I'm going to have office spaces. This is all known data. Mm -hmm. You know, um, what is it? Ashray 130, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And 90.1 when it came out where it defined what the loads are per person per room. These are not new pieces of information. These are well-formed, well-thought-out criteria mm -hmm. for room. Now, it's been altered by the advent of technology. I mean, look at the impact of LED lighting on electrical loads, right? Right, yeah, yep. You know, and, and just that aspect of, of how we've been able to alter what we deliver with system improvements in technology. Mm -hmm. And so, and the reality of it is, is that most architects and, and engineers, they don't stop to say, why don't we make these decisions now? And so, it's a, it's a, workflow and process change mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. i had the fortune of getting sent through project management training a few years ago and learned about learned about work breakdown structures stuff mm -hmm. that i never use right right <laughs> but it made me understand better where we had to be changing where our decision making process occurs mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. like we won't start a project anymore unless we have a valid survey now, yep. my water group that i work with and i'm liaison for mm -hmm. i won't let them start a, a pump station or a water treatment plant unless they've got a damn good survey that's coordinate correct right because yeah. everything in that project relies on its location, especially in a gravity fed system. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can't kick that can down the road. Right. You've got to make these decisions earlier. And so that's why it's so important, even within the MEP systems to understand how those relationships work yeah. and how yeah. that, how it's going to alter what happens in a project. So get that equipment out there, pick your targets and sources and get them in. Uh, even if they're just placeholders, it doesn't right. matter. Get them right. in there. And that's, that's kind of what I was curious about. And, and, and honestly, I have the same argument on the architecture side. I, I, I don't understand generic walls, right? It's if you chose an eight inch wall, you probably have an assumption what the real wall is. So why not just it's place the real wall? wall? And I, I, as an architect, I say this to, to my you know, fellow architects. It's, it's, you know, you put a one foot, four inch exterior wall. There's a reason why you chose that because you have a feeling there's a makeup that exists of brick and airspace. And so why not just use the wall? And the same thing with systems, you know, you spent the time even drawing, we get a lot of line diagrams still in SD and, yep. and, and you know, drafted line diagram. You spend all that time doing that. Is it really that more challenging to 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 model those things, and then I mean, just delete them afterwards, remodel? I mean, I mean, I, I don't know. It's just it, it sounds like a lot of effort, and, and 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 I think you hit the nail on the head. It's it's a workflow process, you know, understanding of of it's okay to make decisions earlier and change things right. down the road. I think that's kind of what it comes down to. Yeah. Right. We do guilt by association. If you look at my Revit model right now. You look in there and you see that wall, you see that Pepto-Bismol pink wall. <laughs> yeah. 
that's a generic wall, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and so uh, we, we started playing this guilt trip on the architects to say, hey, you haven't designed this wall yet. We're going to make a Pepto-Bismol pink. <laughs> and even if you go to a 3D view, the whole wall is pink, right? <laughs> I love and so, it. But it's a great way to think about it. I mean, if you're teaching somebody how to do this and you're saying, hey, okay, their gut instinct is I don't know what it is, mm-hmm. put it out there. There is one rule about about the architectural structure I need to pass on. For the, for the love of Pete, do not delete a wall if you're just going to put another type in change it that way we don't lose our host and we don't do that change the type to something else you know even if you're going to move it change the type to something else because that guid that's associated with it is so important especially when we start associating mep equipment with a wall or a ceiling or a floor or anything like that Mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you're not just randomly deleting stuff just to put it back in think about what you're doing there was a a quick conversation um i uh, i think kevin started it in the chat and it had to do with um, if you're when you're placing targets and sources first, if you're in a larger building, let's say it's a five, 10 story building, is there a flow, uh, you know, bottom to top, top to bottom or anything like that, that you would you would suggest how you would approach the whole target source? Um, would you lay I, out I I mean, my, want... my, my addition to that is actually, would you lay out, for example, all the targets and sources, the whole building and then go back and do the relationships and then go back geometry? Or would you do maybe like a whole floor at a time target source? I mean, I guess it depends on what this Either way works. I'm really dependent on the architect, though. Yeah. Because I, let's say that he's done the first, second, and third floor, and he's got the rooms laid out, and they, well, if he's got that done, I can move forward. Mm-hmm. Right? So I'm really following the lead of the architect in that case. Yeah. Where are they working? So it's really not set in that case. But like I said, it's a hierarchical system, so it always works better when you go from the bottom up, right? Mm-hmm. Because as you go, like, you know, on the top floors of a building, it depends on where the air handling units are. If they're on the roof, you know, the larger sizes are going to come from the top down. So yeah. it's better to work from the bottom up because it's going to have a bigger impact on openings and things like that within the building. Right. Yep. So you want to think about those structures and you want to think about what that load is going to be. And you need the accumulative value of that load coming up through the building, right. To understand Mm -hmm. what that size is going to be. And even if you haven't placed the duct, you'll see the load from everything that's already there. Mm -hmm. And that will help you make the decision earlier to make that chase larger or smaller, whatever it needs to be. Yeah. So, it's all about harvesting the data. Yeah, and, and I have to say, I'm, I'm having a little epiphany moment, and I have to share it with everyone because, <laughs> you know, uh, on the construction side, you know, we're, we're dealing a lot of the time with the coordination in the field aspect of it. And it's funny because when when we're modeling our fabrication level, H, you know, ductwork and, and, and whatnot, mm-hmm. um, you know, the we always try, we always try and follow the flow of construction uh, with, with how we approach that process. But now that I think right. about it, it's usually core, it's usually shaft and, and vertical is usually the way our construction flow works. You know, we do shaft and core elements, and then we do distribution yeah. per floor. But thinking about this workflow and think about someone actually having to do the modeling, it doesn't really make much sense to, to do the core work first if if it's coming from the targets and sources that are outside of the shaft, right? And so, and so right. I'm almost like, I, I'm, I'm almost thinking now, especially now that we have much more of our, our contractors using Revit versus AutoCAD or oh, CAD yeah. MEP, I may, I may start asking them like, are we like, we must be causing some issues here by making you guys do all the shafts first and then do this and then spread the distribution because they're kind of, they're kind of being forced to start with duct and feed out to everything mm-hmm. else. And then they probably, once they connect, they probably have to go backwards, right? To check everything. And they got to <laughs> fix what didn't fit. I, I, I ne- and, never, there's an epiphany. You just have, it just, it just makes complete sense now that I think about it. <laughs> uh, and and it's, it's stupid little things like that, that, that drive you crazy. And it, and it's, and that's the thing about it is, is that you have to think about how this hor- hierarchy plays out, right? Mm-hmm. You have to be able to put that in context. And that's why the modeling aspect of this is so important to start it earlier, right? Mm-hmm. Because if you're waiting until 60% to start laying out air terminals, you're already in trouble right. because you're not going to know what the load is unless you manually sit there. And I want to talk about this as, an, as a traditional failure from CAD, right? Because mm-hmm. in CAD, what do we do? We're just drafting. We're throwing stuff out there. And by the way, if I hear one more person tell me that I can do a project faster in 2D than I can in 3D, I swear I'm going to throw something out. <laughs> I don't care. I, I, do, I did a valve box that was 10 by 10 in Revit and did it in 20 minutes. Come on. <laughs> And then I, I had all my I, views from it. So stop telling me that, right? <laughs> I have to imagine, I hope that most of my audience here would agree that 
it's faster in 3D than 2D, I hope. Well, <laughs> if, I hope if so too, if but we still get some If you've been following this channel for 12 plus years and you've been following me, I hope that you're in the same boat as us as far as that thinking is concerned, but maybe not. And, and if you need some well, this is a therapy we're all telling you right now, people. right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is therapy for those people. You know, come into the group here, you know, come in, we're all gonna be wearing robes in a little bit, right? Yeah, Kumbaya, yeah. come in, we're all gonna right. get you on board. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> so awesome. so and, and that's the thing you know kid you just don't have those relationships you, mm. you're not accumulating that data right and so that was to me the failure of cad is that we got so dependent and the beauty of cad is yeah i can change anything i can do it anytime i want the weakness of cad is i can change anything i can do it anytime i want it made us lazy right mm -hmm. i love autocad to death my career has been built on autocad and revit and AutoCAD made us lazy and revit made us go back to the drafting board where you had to know everything mm -hmm. before you started right yeah. And it made us think about our designs more. And I think that's one of the things that's really changed in the BIM Omniverse that we were talking about the other day, right? Is this mindset change of the importance of making these decisions sooner mm -hmm. and understanding what the what the end should be, right? right. Yep. Got to make that decision so, sooner. Right. So Agreed. On all um, fronts. On all fronts, for sure. <laughs> so kind of closing this out, I made a comment about looking towards new deliverables with clients and customers. Mm -hmm. And I want to throw a bone at you right here. Sure. I wrote a blog article back a few months ago. I actually wrote more in the last year and had some health issues that really inspired me to write mm. and put out some blog posts. But this is something I've been thinking about. I've been trying to teach this class at AU for years called the Revit Point of Views, right? Mm. And initially my thought was, is that I want to explain the importance of a view in a project, you know, and how the different views work, the regular viewports, when you cut a section at a side, you know, how you make all this stuff work to give clarity and meaning to what it is that you're building. Mm -hmm. And it made me think about something. Why are we so damn dependent on a CAD standard in sheets? I Why are we? wish I could tell you that. <laughs> the I mean, if you think about it, you get dictated to all the time, even in a Revit model. I had a review come back where they complained that I didn't have their named textile. Mm in a model that I delivered. And I'm like, okay, it's a 332nd inch tight mm -hmm. text height with aerial fonts, right? So it looks right. Mm -hmm. Who cares if it's called client name 10 point as opposed to my 332nd of an inch high text, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then I got to thinking more about our dependency on the sheet. And when we talk about wanting to change an industry, you have to be willing to kick the crutch out that we lean on the hardest, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the CAD standards and the sheets. It's the appearance of right. the documents that takes way too much precedence in a design project. Correct. And let me tell you something, when you get into BIM, when you get into project information modeling, and now you start to talk about digital twins, mm -hmm. there is no money in line weight. Nope. It's irrelevant. Yep. And or so that, the or that fill dot in your schedule or that, you know, that graphic standard, yes. that, that legend that exists in your, your wall type schedule, like that stuff has zero value in that world. <laughs> So here's why the reason why I say this is that we don't invest enough money in the data that goes into a model. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough people that circuit receptacles. We don't have enough people that assign the load to the receptacles. Mm -hmm. in, in New York last a couple of weeks ago, New York Build, I had the opportunity to speak with a lot of industry leaders. And there was one gentleman up there um, that worked for GAFCON, his name's John, and he's on the uh, digital twin, um, a, a digital twin committee. And I can't remember the name of it right off the top of my head. But he made the point. He said, there's more representation of a digital twin here in your phone because this is a true digital twin of yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So as I'm looking at this stuff and I look at what I have on here, you know, I've got my medical apps on here that talk about my medical history. Right. Everybody has their banking information on here, right? Let's get mm -hmm. the hell out of me, right? I'm scared of my wife who's an officer with a bank. <laughs> but you think about that, we have more data that's about us in this one piece of a computer than anything right now. And we have far less data about what goes on behind the walls, above the ceiling and below the floor and MAP systems and what we put in our models. Mm -hmm. I'd be willing to bet you that we as an industry, if we could get rid of the, the dominant feature of having to rely on CAD standards and replace it with content standards and documentation standards that say make the text 330 second of an inch tall and not say it has to be a specific type, right? Right, right. That's where you get your money back to start making systems work for you. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and, to, and to get it to where we can put that data in to where we get closer to that true digital twin. Mm-hmm. Because for me, I'm 61 years old, man. This is, this is your stuff. This is what you guys need. This is what the next generation needs to be successful is the ability to understand what a digital twin is and to recreate it correctly. So the next person doesn't have to guess what's behind that daggone wall. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So that we do a better job of renovations, a better job keeping cost in control. 100%. And so that's just, that's, that's my soapbox for today. It drives me crazy when we talk about systems for people to understand, you got to be willing to give something up to make it work better for you. Mm-hmm. Why not make it the sheet? Right. It, it, and, and it's a perfect, it's a perfect topic within this topic because uh, I think uh, for the most part, what's happened, and this happens in architecture too. This is just this isn't just MEP. This is architecture. This is all disciplines. You know, we we we've adopted Revit as a a new drafting platform, not as a BIM platform, right? It, that's everyone's using it now, but it's all the the ends is st- the end result is still the the document, and so that reflects on what you're saying there. And, and it's always easy to eventually know that you know. At the end of the day, I'm just producing plans. So if I have to override this graphic and throw a text mm-hmm. note on there, I'm good to go. But to your point, if you're building it, if you're building a good system, if you're using the tools and connecting them and, and putting the data in there, you can't cheat some of that stuff, first of all, which is good, right? Right. <laughs> and, oh, absolutely. And, and and in theory, your documents will be better. I mean, at the end of the day, the 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 the, the adoption of this will make your documents better. But I am completely on board with you and I've, you know, over the last couple of years, that's kind of my new driving force for the rest of my life, essentially. And and the same at Turner Construction where I work my day job and the same here on the Mm -hmm. Revit is, is I want to see before I retire, whenever that day comes, you know, a long ways to go, man, no documents. (laughs) I want to see building, you know, models as deliverables and, and, and I want to see the end of the sheet as we know it. So that's, that's my end goal. So I appreciate it. And I completely agree. And, 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 and and feel your your uh, your thoughts on that post. <laughs> so I wanted to close out one slide in here before I hit my last yep. one, and I, and I wanted to talk a little bit about this. We have an obligation as an industry to do a better job of educating people what we do, right? And so you know, as we change these deliverables, and this is a little project we did for Rutgers, you know, MEP project, just an outfit of a room that if you look at this, you look at the clarity of the documentation and the ease in which somebody can differentiate between what's going on, you know, and what it takes to make this work are the people that are actually behind the scenes and the training that we put into them and the training investments that that we make in ourselves are what's going to make this work. And and I want to tell everybody that's on this group out here, your training doesn't stop at five o'clock. Okay. I I never stopped at five o'clock. You know, you get to the point where you are by investing in yourself. And and we as companies and communities, we do things like AU, you know, where our company is gone. And I've had thousands of people in my classes up there that have been great friends of mine for years. You know, but even if it's something like with my granddaughter teaching her how to fish, what does that next generation need to know? And have a damn good time doing it, right? <laughs> Enjoy what you do because think about it. There's not a lot of people that get to do some of the cool stuff that we really get to do. And where we are in the edge of in the evolution of the technology, what's coming is going to be phenomenal. And so you got to prepare yourself for it. And so it's really cool to to take the time and train yourself and invest in this and learn how to do this. And so I'm gonna give you my last one to get out of this. Yeah. And we're gonna take questions right after this. But I am teaching the full class of this. I pr- I put in a proposal for AU. This will be my 20th year on AU if I get accepted. And so I'm going to send out those little two and a half dollar checks to everybody who votes for me. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if you want to see more of this and really get into the, into the weeds about it, we're going to try to bring this up to AU this year and do this class again. Cause I've taught it. I've taught it uh, half a dozen times. It's won two top speaker awards for me. And we get a lot of information You get into a lot more detail. The handouts alone are worth admission because they're, they're 140 pages of how to do systems. Right. Right. And I, so, I will make sure yeah. that uh, links uh, in the description here on YouTube and when I post it on my blog tomorrow at the Revit um, I'll make sure to have a link to not just your blog post you mentioned, but also uh, a link to vote for your class on AU. I have to imagine that you'll get plenty of votes and, and, and you'll be uh, you'll be approved. So <laughs> well, that's my shameless plug. But again, I, <laughs> I got to do it with you because you get some. I've been looking at the people that show up in here and a lot of the guys who you had are really good friends of mine. And it's kind of like, 
you know, the traffic that you get and the amount of people that you get up here, you really see the passion of people in the industry. And that's really cool to see. And, I, and, and to add on to, to what you said before, I think the fact that, uh, you know, the, I think at most we had somewhere around 70 or 80 people concurrently here um, at 9 p.m. If you're in East Coast, I guess, but <laughs> sitting here for an hour listening to us talk about MEP systems and, and get on a few soapboxes here and there uh, shows that, that we do have these people still you know, in our industry. And, and, and if you're out there and you're one of those, you know, stay curious, keep doing this and, and, and together you and I and David and the rest of us, uh, mm-hmm. we, we can we can move to those, you know, beyond those frustrating conversations you have every day with the people you work with, trying to convince them of what you know is the truth and what you know right. is the best and what you know is the way we should be doing things. And hopefully, uh, you know, eventually the, the, the mob will follow. <laughs> and that's we'll all we can kicking hope for. We're dragging the screaming into the 19th century, right? <laughs> that's all we can hope for. Well, David, And man, you all get is, a really cool is, hat when you exactly. do it. <laughs> this, is, this has been awesome. I'm going to definitely... Uh, 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 jot down the four steps. I'll uh, I'll put the 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 chapters here on YouTube so everyone can follow along with them. Um, what what's the best other than the 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 links that I post there? Is the best place to reach you is is on blog on your LinkedIn and, and where where would you like people to find you? Uh, LinkedIn honestly is the best place to get up with me. I okay. mean I, I get a lot of people to ask me questions up there every day. Be aware that if you are posting questions to Autodesk. And you might see me pop up and answer your question, right? If you're posting MEP questions, they may get to David. <laughs> yeah, they may get to me. So if I see them, I'll try to grab them. But at the same time, you know, events like AU is always a great place to find me. You know, I, I try to go there every year, whether I'm teaching or not. You know, but it, like I said, the best way to get up with me is via LinkedIn. And I think most of the people communicate with me that way. Awesome. And I'll make sure to put a link to link to your LinkedIn profile as well below. So. Uh, thank awesome. you, David. Thanks for joining. This was this was fantastic. Thank you guys all for joining us live as well. There was a bunch of great chat going on, even conversations between folks in the chat, which I love seeing. Um, you guys are amazing. Thanks for joining. Um, see you again next week, Thursday, nine o'clock. I'll be here. Uh, new guests, uh, fun topic. And uh, with that, I bid you adieu. Thank you to Twin Motion for sponsoring. Um, and then make sure again that you subscribe to the channel here on YouTube. And yeah, you guys are amazing. I'll see you soon. Have a great night.